So, today's episode is going to be again about Peter Drucker's The Effective Executive. And this one's going to be about the second principle and probably also about the third principles because it's it's not that much, as I'm just seeing right now. But yeah, there's going to be more after the intro, as always. Hello. As always. As always. As always. Well, yeah. And I'm, I, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy to be here and record this episode and just talk about this actually pretty amazing book. You know, this pretty amazing book that also talks about some things that might be really relevant for you, even if you're not an executive, because I am not an executive, you know, but I also try to be more efficient besides not being an executive. But yeah, before I even want to go through the episode, there is maybe a few things that I should cover. The first thing is, it is a podcast and a YouTube channel, which means that if you really want to listen to whatever I'm going to talk about today, you can. But also, if you're just listening at this point in time and you feel like watching might be a little tiny bit better, then please also check out the show notes and check out the links, and there should be the link to the YouTube channel as well, and also vice versa. So if you're on a YouTube channel and you would really like to have the podcast, then please also check out the links in the description because there should basically be everything. On the other hand, there's also links to the PDFs. Um, there's always a free PDF, or there should actually always be a free PDF that is covering everything that I'm going to talk about today, or sometimes even the whole article. You know, it just depends on, on what I've been doing, on just if I've gone through everything already and whatnot. Like, um, everything is going to be in these PDFs, and these are just really valuable then, because they are basically a summary of at this, or with this example, it's going to be a summary of the summary, which is like, okay, really dense, you know, dense information, not really long, but um, on some other occasions, it's going to be like articles that I went through, multiple things that I went through, multiple sources of information, and then you're going to have everything into one PDF, which is amazing, with the sources and whatnot. It's amazing. So please check out the PDFs and they're also completely for free. You can also print them and just share them and do whatever with them. I think it's just a great way to also have some written content, you know, and some written things because people do not only want to watch, do not only want to listen, but some of them actually do want to read some things. But yeah, and as you already can see on the left side, here is the summary. Let's actually make it a little tiny bit smaller. Or no, maybe I have to do this. Well, I actually do not want to do that. Well, you know, let's take it as it is. What can I contribute? Which is the next question that we probably should ask ourselves. To ask what can I contribute is to look for the unused potential in a job and what is considered excellent performance in a good uh, in a good many positions is often but a pale shadow of the job's full potential of contribution. Probably, yeah. Only because you're doing something good or you're good in whatever position you're in, there's going to be a lot of things that you still can do as a CEO, as a sales manager, as a who, whomever you are. But on the flip side, I do also think that it really depends on what job you're having and it really just depends on your position. Like, I mean, if you just, I don't know, no, if you're just a, an internship guide, then I don't really know internet connection. I'm not even having an internet connection. Uh, that's insane. That's insane, you know, because I'm highlighting everything live so that it's going to be in the PDF because everything that I've highlighted is then going to be in the PDF. Now it should be fine. Yes. So, so yeah, I think it really depends on what position you're in. And of course, the inter internship guy is not probably going to be able at least that much to change a lot of things. And, you know, of course, it depends on the company as well. And it also depends on your boss. And, you know, there's so many different variables that play into that. But yeah, I would just also say so. Like, there's a lot of potential, potentially, that, um, that we haven't been going for up to this point. The next thing. For every organization needs performance in three major areas. It needs direct results, building of values and their reaffirmation, and building and developing people for tomorrow. Yes, totally. Totally. We need things right now. I don't really know what they want to say with building of values and their reaffirmation. Might be about branding, you know, and building and developing people for, for tomorrow might be about trainings. It might be about actually looking into the future and trying to brand things and do things in a way that are going to result in results in the future. And not only just results in the now, like not really only short-term thinking, but also long-term thinking. 
You know, because as we know, most often it is the case that short-term thinking is not the best thinking. You know, short-term thinking as I'm going to smoke a cigarette, this is short-term thinking, rather than, okay, I'm not going to smoke a cigarette because I know that I'm going to be fucked in 10 years if I start smoking right now. Or just the exact same thing with whatever you're consuming, food, whatever. Like many, many, many different things I could talk about there. The next one, the man who asks himself or asks of himself, what is the most important contribution I can make to the performance of this organization, asks in effect, what self-development do I need? What knowledge and skill do I have to acquire to make the contribution I should be making? I should, I, I would, I would not really say should, you know, because it's, for me, it's like, it's not what you should be doing. You know, you should be, you should be doing your job, probably, you know, it just depends on what what stands in your contract, you know, this is what you should be doing. But but it's, but this is not really about what you can do then, but what he talks about is what you can do, you know, what what can you do for the organization if you want to, you know, it, it's not that you have to do that, but you can. And I think it's a good idea. First of all, it might create a lot of opportunities for you also in the future as well, but it would also just be kind of amazing to to maybe also see for yourself what you're capable of doing. I don't know if you know that. And the last question is, what strengths do I have to put to work and what standards do I have to set myself? I have to set myself, yeah. Uh, even though standards is also like, it's difficult, you know, because standards, it's basically the exact same thing as quality is. And this is also something subjective. Quality is subjective, but quantity is not really subjective. Which means that, okay, you know, you can have an amazingly done uh, copy written text, yes. But just just because you think it is amazing doesn't really mean that your boss also thinks that it is amazing. And just because your boss thinks it is amazing doesn't really mean that the client thinks that it is amazing or the end consumer thinks that it is amazing. Like there, there really is a lot into that. And quantity can lead to quality, which means... If you really try out a lot of different things, if you really try out a lot of different ways to to write a text, different titles, different descriptions, different whatever, then you can figure out through just experimenting basically or actually trying out what the audience wants to have. You know, what's having uh, the best click-through rate, what is having the most attention, what creates the most engagement and all those things, which is basically, as I'm thinking about it, which is quite something uh, interesting I have to say this is basically what Tim Ferriss did with the four hour I think it's been actually the four hour uh, the the four hour work week you know the first four hour week uh, or the first four hour book Um, he basically just because the I think it's been the uh, what is it called the publisher yeah the publisher said like okay I'm not really quite sure about the title you know I don't know you know maybe it should be I think because, in fact, it is all about two hours. You know, I think it's not even four hours that Tim Ferriss was working in his business or on his business in the very um, later periods of him being an executive. But um, but in the end, what he did is he tried out what works best. And what he did is having multiple Facebook ads, as far as I know. Or what I know is that he had a lot of ads. And he just created a lot of ads with different combinations. And there you have to kind of be a little bit like a conscious of uh, cost reasons, I would say. You know, if you're just having five different titles and five different descriptions or five different subtitles, then there's going to be a fucking lot of different combinations you can do. And uh, this is something that he did automatically. I didn't really understand how he did it, you know, but maybe you can Google that. You're probably going to find it on his blog or somewhere else. But he tried out all the different ways or all the different combinations that you can just have with, I think it's been like three tiles or something. I'm actually not quite sure. And also the descriptions that he had. And then he just used the one for the, for our work week that performed the best. As easy as it is, you know, the last one. He always, at the end of his meetings, goes back to the opening statement and relates the final conclusion to the original intent. You know, and if it is like completely something different, then it is fucked up because we are having meetings for specific reasons, you know, and if we are just kind of drifting away and we're talking about something completely different, it is fucked up, you know, and then you've basically lost a lot of time and also uh, wasted a lot of time in the end as well, unfortunately then. 
But I think, and this is also something that I've lately accumulated from Tim Ferriss, is having the end in mind and starting from the end to the beginning, basically, is often a pretty great idea. And this is also just good if you think about it in terms of meetings, because if you know that you should end in this and that way, then you're going to start your meeting in a completely different way, I guess. You know, if the end result should be like, a statement, if it should be numbers, if it should be a decision, if it should be whatever, then also the very first question that you are going to ask in the very first minute of the meeting is going to be a different one. You know, the whole structure maybe even of the meeting is going to be differently or different and how you're treating the meeting is also going to be different, you know, and also how other people are going to meet this or are going to uh, act in this meeting or are going to just treat this meeting is probably also going to be different. So this is an amazingly important one, I would say, just knowing what to do and how you're going to end. And uh, Tim Ferriss, and I think this is actually a really good way to explain it, um, was also talking about business there. You know, if you just truly know how you want to exit a business, you really have to think about different schemes and different, well, actually basically schemes of managing your business and structuring your business from the first second on. You know, because if you know, okay, I'm going to sell my business for this and that amount of money or just knowing that you're going to sell your business, you know, without you being an executive in it. So you're going to completely sell it. You're then not having anything to do with it any longer. And then that's quite it. You're going to have to structure your business in a completely different way. I assume, you know, then if you would just, I don't know, build it to whatever business and work on it for the rest of your life, if this is what you want to do. You know, which is, of course, a pretty good idea, I guess, for, for some people, not for everyone, but for some people. And he also was talking about BJJ, like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, which is a martial arts, if you don't know. And he said that Marcelo Garcia, which is like a really top tier, um, well, no, I'm sorry. It's been his friend, Josh Waitzkin, which, um, which actually was, or who was featured in the latest episode of the Tim Ferriss podcast. And please, please, please check it out. It is an amazing podcast. You can learn so much from Tim Ferriss himself and also from the guests that he's having on the podcast. Like there's different people from magicians to uh, one to billionaires to just entrepreneurs to billionaire entrepreneurs. Like there's so many different people that I, that he's having on his podcast around different topics that he's interested in, he's interested in and also the audience of him is interested in, which he probably knows. But um, indeed really interesting, indeed really cool. But John Waitskin, I think he is pronounced in that way. I think I've kind of nailed that, but I'm not quite sure. Um, he was actually kind of a, a student of Marcelo Garcia, which has been uh, like the top tier best uh, BJJ martial artist there is the winner of nine championships as far as I can remember and many different other things. And uh, John Waitskin, the friend of Tim Ferriss, showed him one specific move, one specific move that is kind of the quote unquote basis or one of the most important moves or that is, well, how should I say it? Like learning this one move, move, move um, will create such an environment, I would say, that you're going to be able to accumulate also other skills in BJJ. So it's basically like a, a really important move, you know, and it is, I don't know, maybe 50% of BJJ, even though, like, yeah, maybe even of self-defense, depends on how you think about it, but it's the guillotine. It's basically like a joke, um, and I'm actually going to show it in the exact same fucking way as Tim Ferriss showed it. Um, you're having the opponent in between your arm and your chest, you know, you basically know how to, how to do that, and then you're going to, um, actually, what you're doing is you're having the neck of your, well, no, yeah, you're having the hat in, I think it's called the armpit, isn't it? You know, you're having the neck on your armpit and then you're going to close down and most often you're also going to bring back your shoulders and also stretch out your your uh, pecs so that it creates a lot of tension on the uh, neck and therefore also on the blood streams or I don't actually know what they're called, veins? Are oh, they called veins? And there's going to be a lot of attention, attention, of course, yeah, attention on the veins, which leads the person to then go sub, uh, conscious or unconscious. Because if you basically hold down the veins that are just pumping blood to your brain, uh, if you hold them down, then you're going to go unconscious because there's not, uh, or there's no blood then to your brain and whatnot. And yeah, I hope I've 
basically explain it in a, in a relatively good way. I don't know. Well, anyway, I think we could actually also go through the next one, which is making strength productive. Yeah, let's actually go through it, you know, because we're having five minutes left or more, actually. Making strength productive. He knows that one cannot build on, one cannot build on weakness. To achieve results, one has to use all the available strengths, the strengths of associations, the strengths of the superior, and one owns strengths. So basically what I'm seeing there is that it's just thinking about resources. You know, I'm having my resources, then I'm having also the other people, and then I'm having the people that I associate myself with, and all, all those things. Whoever tries to place a man or staff an organization to avoid weakness will end up at best with mediocrity. I'm going to read it again because I think it's important. Whoever tries to place a man or staff an organization to avoid weakness will end up at best with mediocrity. Yes, avoiding weakness. You know, there, there's always going to be some weaknesses. But we can really build on our strengths. And once we do that, we're going to have... A, basically, it's not going to be very symmetric. You know, you're going to have a product that is really good in one hand, but there's going to be weaknesses. But I don't necessarily want to say that having a product that is just equally good at everything is what people want to have, because I don't think so. Effective executives know that their subordinates are paid to perform and not to please their superiors. Yes, and I think it's a really great, it's actually a really great thing to think about, you know. They should perform and they should make something cool. Um, of course, I mean, if it, is a, if it is a piece of shit person, then I don't know if you should even employ this person even though you know that it is that this person is really good at what he or she should be doing i don't know i think just being able to communicate and being nice and and just being able to communicate with people and work with people is always just a really important thing you know because of course one person can be really good but if it is like cancer and your whole organization the whole culture in the organization or for the culture in the organization it's not going to be good it's really really not going to be good Really not. And it is something that a lot of other people have been thinking and also talking about. Um, the first one. It's certainly not the first one. Like, really, really not. Well, the effective executive therefore first makes sure that the job is well designed. And if experience tells him otherwise, he does not hunt for geniuses to do the impossible. Yeah, which makes sense. Like, if your job is like, or if the thing that this person should be doing is like complete bullshit, and, and and impossible and even though impossible like what is impossible like you're yeah, probably not gonna have a job that's impossible unless it somehow just includes like research and really experimenting on things and trying to make things happen and whatnot but yeah the effective exodus knows that to get strength on uh one has to put up with weaknesses yeah probably you're not gonna be good at everything this is what i'm seeing there it is generally a waste of time to talk to a reader. He only, list, he only listens after he has read. It is equally a waste of time to submit a voluminous report to a listener. He can only grasp what it is all about through the spoken word. I do not really get it, but I, <laughs> but I do think it is important. It might be about like the people and just being a little bit smart about what you're doing to to people or what you're trying to give to people whether it is a customer or the client or the employees like some people are this kind of people and some people are that kind of people and we should just make smart decisions based on it i guess you know in terms of like okay this person should be doing this this person should be doing that and whatnot like whatever that might be all in all the effective executive tries to be himself he does not pretend to be someone else he looks at his own performance and at his own results and tries to discern a pattern. What are the things he asks? What uh, that I seem to be able to do with relative ease while they come rather hard to other people? And yeah, indeed, I think that's a great question to ask yourself because once you know that then you're able to just show this to the other people and you can, also, you can then deconstruct the skill or whatever you're doing, I don't fucking know. And then you're able to tell the other people or just teach it to the other people that might want to learn that or just might have to learn that like you, you can make them have to learn it yeah <laughs> i don't know if it is going to be a good idea because i don't know like if people don't want to learn something and you really want to make them learn something it's not always going to be a good idea but yeah anyway uh no the wrong one i'm sorry 
this is going to be the end of the episode. And I really have to thank you really a lot. Um, also because I've seen today, again, two new subscribers. And it is just really something that feels amazing. So thank you. Even though you, you haven't subscribed, thank you really much for clicking on the video. And thank you really, really, really a lot for going through this episode with me. 20 minutes is a lot of time. You know, 20 minutes is quite some time in a person's life. And quote unquote wasting that or quite uh, actually using it for something like this. It just, yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. I wish you the best health, of happiness, and all success. And also hope that you're going to remind us all of how you're going to be remembered, which basically means your legacy and basically means just being a nice person and then being remembered as a nice person. On the other hand, there's three other questions that I'm having for you, which are why are you here? What are you trying to change? And the last one is what is bothering you the most? These three questions are hopefully going to show you your purpose and maybe even a business idea. Hopefully, maybe, probably, it would be amazing. I would appreciate that. But yeah, um, see you the next time. I at least hope. And I wish you a great day. And thank you a lot. Bye-bye.